right? But also, you got to win the battle of ideas. How, how are we going to solve? How are we going to solve the problem that we have in the United States today, which is marching down with 1944 Hayek called the road to serfdom, right? We're heading back down towards serfdom. We're heading down to the place where your liberties are listed and defined by the government, and it's not the other way around. That you have, like the Ninth Amendment says, right? The Ninth Amendment says you have all sorts of liberties, and unless the government tells you you don't have them, you've got them, okay? So it's, it's just the opposite. I tell my students, what are you, what's your attitude today? Your attitude today is if you're going to park your car, you're going to look for a place that says you can park here, you look for a place that says, don't park here. You assume you can park anywhere else. If this were the Middle Ages, you wouldn't assume that way. But the problem is, we're moving back towards the Middle Ages. We're moving back towards central planning. Imagine, imagine that your federal government could make it so it could tell you what kind of light bulb you could buy. <laughs> Suppose it went that far. Suppose it went so far it told you how many gallons of water could flush through your toilets. What if it went that far? What if it went so far as to tell you what, whether you have to have birth control in your health insurance or not? What if it went that far? You'd be heading back down the road to serve them. You'd be heading back down to where the king is telling you what to do. So how do we how do we stop that? Well, you stop that by by winning the battle of ideas, right? I mean, that's how you do it. What you know? What is Bob Schaefer doing? I mean, he's trying to win the battle of ideas, right? Why are you guys here trying to win the battle of ideas? Why are your kids go to Liberty Common trying to win the battle of ideas? Okay? Why is Hillsdale College trying to win the battle of ideas? You know? And so the question is, how does one go about that, right? Well. Um, the way you go about that is getting their attention and getting them to observe something. How many ever saw the, the show Seinfeld? What's funny about Seinfeld? It's because he gets you to observe, right? He's got the lady that stands too close to you, right? Or, um, he, you know, uh, they'll, they'll uh, you know, there was one where uh, I think the, the guy had lent out his suit uh, when he had taken it into the dryer, he then, you know, leased it to somebody overnight. He sees the same suit there, right? Which is how your, uh, how your um, banking system works. But nonetheless, what he does is he tries to get you to observe these little things that are hilarious once you observe them. You've seen them all the time. But then Seinfeld points them out to observe. So that's what you got to do. Guess what happened today? Nine million people woke up today in New York City and there was exactly the right amount of Starbucks coffee. And the exactly the right amount of bagels, and exactly the right amount of peanuts, and exactly the right amount of shoes. And the same thing happened in Baltimore, and it happened in Chicago, and yet nobody's in charge. How in the world does that work? Right? You gotta get people that, wow, how does that work? Right? How can that be? And then what do you know? You know that if you really thought about it, suppose the government decided what the price of bagels was going to be and how many bagels to assign to every, every you know, bagel outlet in New York City. Do you think we would have woke up today and there wouldn't have been you know, lines at you know, some bagel shops and not enough at other bagel shops? You know that. So why in the world would you want your government to allocate health care? Right? That makes sense. So if you're going to argue about this stuff, what do you have to do? You have to show people, you know, get them to observe for a second, and then you can start talking to them about how it works. Because unlike, you know, unlike me who gets an hour to talk to you guys, you don't normally get to do that to your neighbor. Say, hey, let's talk about the minimum wage for an hour. No, right? If you want to talk to them about minimum wage, you want to give them the minimum wage, you want to say, you know what? You know, my congressman uh, has, has, has proposed the following. He says he wants to make it against the law for anybody who can't, who can't uh, sell their labor for $15 an hour, makes it against the law for them to sell their labor. Well, what if you can't make $15 an hour worth of stuff? Well, I guess they're just going to have to go sell, you know, work for some Mexican drug cartel or something. They don't have minimum wage, right? Or I guess they're just going to have to rely on the government for the rest of their life. Right? That's what minimum, minimum wage is about Walmart, 
not being able to pay you less than $15 an hour. In fact, who would be in favor of a, a higher minimum wage? It's going to be Walmart. Why is that? Because you're running, uh, you know, you're in Gelter's Hardware Store in downtown Hillsdale, right? And there's a, there's a Walmart up in Jonesville, the next city over. We're not big enough to have a Walmart. We don't even have a Dollar General. But uh, anyway, um, so so what happens? You know, you, you have your bolt, and you, you don't have the, the nut to fit it. So what do you do? You go into Gelter's Hardware, they go in, they find it for you, they charge you 50 cents, uh, and you walk out the door, right? Go to Walmart with your little bolt and say, oh, can anybody help me find, you know, the nut that fits this bolt? You think that's going to happen? No, it's not going to happen. Why not? Because they don't sell service. What do they sell? Stuff. Okay? What is your local hardware store? They sell service. What do they need to sell service? They need people. They need to pay that, you know, college student from Hillsdale College to stand behind the counter and, and know where the bolts are. Okay? But if they got to pay $15 an hour to do that, they can't do that. And go to Walmart, right? Do they say, oh, there's all sorts of uh, uh, counters open. Uh, you can go to you know, number 9 to check out, right? You can go to number 12 to check out. No. When you go there, what do you see? Check yourself out, right? Self-checkout, right? Do you think Gelter's Hardware can have a self-checkout at Gelter's Hardware? No. So what's the deal? The deal is Walmart can substitute capital for labor much more easily than your local hardware store can. And so why would Walmart not be in favor of a minimum wage? They should be in favor of a minimum wage, right? If the government says we can, we can make the price of labor whatever the heck we want it to, right? Walmart should be in there saying, well, you know, I prefer $15. That worked just about right. Not higher, but, you know, $15 would be okay with me. Right? So why shouldn't their lobbies be in there? Because you've got to set the rules of the game up, so that's what happens. But the average person isn't going to think, oh, Walmart would be in favor of minimum wage because they want to drive out the competition of uh, the small hardware dealer. Right? That's not what they're thinking. They don't think... Minimum wage is really about making it so you can't sell your labor. It's a law against you selling your labor. That's what it's a law against. Who's going to lose from that? Who's going to lose? If you raise the minimum wage to $10 an hour in the United States, who's going to lose from that? You think my kid's going to lose from that? No. Why not? Because they can get a job for zero. And what do we call jobs where you go to work, you go to work for this company over the summer, and they pay you zero? What is that called? Yeah, internships. Okay? Why do you think we have internships? Because of the minimum wage. You can have internships in 1970, right? So who's going to get the internship? You think that single mom with three kids in the city of Detroit, you think her kids get the internship at J.P. Morgan? No. Is my kid going to get one? Yeah, because I'm upper middle class. Okay? So who's going to lose from the minimum wage? Who's going to lose that first rung of the ladder? It's not going to be our kids. It's going to be, you know, the, the, the mom with three kids in the East Los Angeles. That's who's going to lose. So what are they doing in Los Angeles? Raising the $15 an hour. You increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour in the city of Los Angeles. And what's that about? It's about making it so that anyone who can't produce $15 an hour worth of stuff has to move to Compton. That's what it's about. But that's not what you can see in the, you know, in the media. That's what your average person is going to say. But once you start to observe it, oh my gosh, that is right. Okay? I can't pay you $20 an hour if you only make $5 an hour worth of stuff, so I'm not going to hire you. So who, who, hurt, who gets hurt in these things? Who gets hurt in these things are the, the poor get hurt in them. Um, let's take, a, the, let's take a, a, the, the issue of inequality. Right? Do we really care about inequality? What is inequality? What about caring about inequality? What's that about? It's what Mises called uh, politics of envy. What do I care about how rich Martin Zuckerberg is? You know, I don't care if he's a billionaire or a trillionaire. What I care about is how rich are the poor, right? And if the poor are wealthy, what do I care how wealthy the wealthiest person is? 
In a market system, we were just saying, a system based on voluntary exchange. So how do I get rich in a market system? Only one way, please other people. That's it. If I please lots of people, then I'm going to be rich. How many people in here have ever paid to listen to me speak? Okay. How many in here, okay, it's a couple, right? How many in here have ever used Microsoft product? See, that's why Bill Gates is rich and I'm not. <laughs> it's that simple. Okay? So, the, are the wealthiest people going to get more wealthy? Yes, they're going to get way, way, way wealthy. The richest person is going to be super wealthy. Why is that? Because now they can please not just 330 million Americans and 500 million people in the, in the Eurozone. They can please 1.3 billion Chinese they couldn't please in 1978. And they can please a billion Indians that they couldn't please in 1992. So now there's 2.3 billion more people that whatever you invent can please all sorts of people. And so what? You can get really, really rich. So I don't care if the really, really rich are really, really rich. You know? At least that's one thing that Donald Trump says that makes sense. Yeah, I'm rich and I'm proud of it. Okay? You should be. You please lots of people to do that. Now, if what happens is the government comes in and starts interfering in this, how do you get rich? You get rich by getting the government to do stuff. Right? You're General Electric, so what do you do, right? You get, you, you have your lobbyists go in, and you get it, so you make it against the law to make incandescent bulbs anymore. So everybody's got to make take LED bulbs. Why is that? Because the, the markup on incandescent bulbs is very small, and the markup on LED bulbs is very big. So I, if I could make it, you guys wouldn't buy them yourself. If you did, I wouldn't have to have a law that told you you can't. Right? If you're, you know, if you're going to say, hey, I don't want these, we don't need a law that says, you know, you can't go out and buy beanie babies. Right? People don't buy new Beanie Babies anymore. We didn't know law against it. The government, you know, the market just said we don't want them. So, what, in a market system, how do I get richer if I'm General Electric? I get richer by going to the government if I'm a stockholder, if I'm a, which I am, I'm a stockholder of General Electric, because I know they're going to help lobbyists. Okay? What should they do? If the rules of the game are that the government can intervene in all this stuff, what am I going to do? I'm going to go out and intervene. Right? And we shouldn't blame those people. I was just testifying in the state senate last two weeks ago in Michigan. Now I was, I was uh, out, you know, I was uh, doing some consulting work for multi-client lobbyists, of course. Um, and uh, maybe we question the part we can talk about that as well. Why special interest groups are going to dominate? But anyway, um, so what what I said was, you know what? I was I'm I'm looking at a bill and Detroit Edison Consumers Power opposed to the part that, that my client is interested in. Um, and I said, look, if I was to try to, I said, look, to the to committee, I'm not, you know, to try to ask lobbyists, consumers, I know they're friends of mine, right? What do they, be, they should be in here lobbying for what they're lobbying for, because it's going to make them better off. But it's not going to make the rest of Michigan better off. It's going to make the rest of us worse off. But they don't have an incentive to do it the other way, because you guys have set up this system where it's a highly regulated uh, monopoly. And so they have all the incentives to do all this other stuff. So what you need to do is, you need to change the incentives, right? You've got to make the incentives such that people want to please other people. How does that happen? Market capitalism. You want to make it so that market capitalists, you don't, you don't want to tax profit, right? Why in the world? You don't want a tax profit. Why? Because that reduces the incentive to innovate, like we were just talking about. How do I get, what's the, what's the incentive to innovate? It's profit. And if the government says, yeah, well, if you're successful, we're going to take away 30% of it, I'm less likely to go on and take on that risk. Just, I mean, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Okay? You know what? In a market system, that ain't quite good enough, is it? If you do unto others what they would have to do unto you, guess what? You know, you'll do okay. But how do you get rich? You do one of those things they don't even know they want done unto them yet. Okay? <laughs> I had no idea 20 years ago I was going to want an iPhone 6 for my son. Right? But Steve Jobs did. 
He said, I bet Darren Wolfram would just love to give his son an iPhone 6 for his 19th birthday. Right? And he was right. Okay? And so what happened? You know, Apple became a huge company. Right? Stock goes where Apple did well. So, what, what is this market system? I mean, it's a super moral system, right? The only way that you can improve yourself is to make other people happy. And you've got to figure out things that they don't even know they're going to be happy with yet. If you look around, just think, just this week, just observe all the things that you use, all the services, all the products, everything that you use today that did not exist in 1950. And guess what? Way more than half of those things didn't exist in 1950, right? Look at every kid that's out there texting on their cell phone. You know, when I was a kid, you couldn't lose your phone. It was stuck on a wall, right? Back at the house, right? If you, you know, if it made sparks. When you, you, didn't, you didn't even want to call somebody that's got two zeros, right? Heck, that guy, you know? <laughs> I mean, the world has changed so quickly, right? I mean, just, just as an example. You know, I just, I just flew out from Detroit, right? I mean, think about this. Talk about somebody that, you know, had trouble with their flight. And they'll say, wow, man, we had to wait for 20 minutes. Then we went and sat on the tarmac for 40 minutes before we even took off. And then would you say to them, well, what happened next? Did you fly like a bird through the sky in a chair? Is that what happened? Okay? People, people don't observe, right? But that's just, you know, every time I get on the plane, I go, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. We're flying, right? Nobody says that, but they should. What made airplanes? Market capitalism made them, right? They didn't have market cap. They knew how to make airplanes. The Greeks knew how to make an airplane, right? Lord Leonardo da Vinci had plans for that kind of stuff. Why? They didn't have an incentive to make the darn thing. And so, what, why, why do we have the wealth that we do? We have the wealth that we do because, um, because this market capitalist system. And, and, and we don't have a government, and, and as the government starts to intervene, we're going to get what we got. Further unintended consequences, further government intervention, and further unintended consequences. So, um, I was just on the phone on the way up, driving up uh, from, uh, uh, where was I? Colorado Springs, yeah. You know what happens? Names and nouns are the first things to go. I don't want you to know that, okay? You'll be 90 years old, you won't forget a verb. Okay. Um, but anyway, I was driving up and uh, this guy from Consumer Reports called, he wanted, you know, this reporter wanted to talk to me, and so I said, okay, but then, you know, call me while I'm driving. And, uh, and so, so I'm talking to him, and he's super concerned. What they, what they did was they looked and they found out that there are, uh, that if you look at black neighborhoods, auto insurance rates are higher in those neighborhoods than they are in white neighborhoods. Or they were predominantly white, and even if you control for income, uh, then that, that's it. And therefore, he wants me to talk about, oh yes, this is terrible, there must be discrimination. So I said to him, well, okay, tell me this. Um, it could possibly be because the cost of servicing is higher there. And in fact, I'm going to bet you that's the only reason. And why is that? Because suppose, in fact, I'm auto owners, and I'm getting uh, $80 uh, for, a, uh, you know, for a policy that it cost me $40 service in the black neighborhood, and I'm only charging $60 for the same cost of service over here in the white neighborhood. Do you think that Geico's not going to figure that out? Right? Do you think that they'll be in good hands with Allstate after a while? So what must be happening? If you see price discrimination over time, you can have it for a short period of time, right? But after a while, somebody else is going to figure that out. They're going to enter the market. And then they're going to start driving the price down. Until what? Until they're equal in the two neighborhoods. If they weren't, people would still keep entering in the one that had the higher price. So I told him. So he still wanted to act like I said, okay, you explain to me why that doesn't happen. Uh, well, I'll have to think about that, right? I said, good, that's the point. 
right? I want you to observe that, you know? And I told him to read my book. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that's, the, you know, what, what happens here is that this guy sees a different price in a black neighborhood and a different price in a white neighborhood, and that's all he does. He sees that. He doesn't observe how that could possibly be. Now, if in fact that's true over time, what must be happening? There's a barrier to entry. And what would that barrier to entry be? Government regulation. And then he, then he goes, oh, you know what, we, we went out and, and we looked at all the contributions that um, insurance companies that, that sell auto insurance, how, that they give to state governments. It's the people running for, state, for a state government office. And I said, don't even tell me. They give an awful lot. They must give tons. I don't even need to, I don't even need to look it up. They must give tons. He goes, oh, yeah, they do. I said, guess what? They're a heavily regulated entity by the state. The state government says, here's what has to be in a policy, and here's what you can sell. They're super regulated by the state. So if that's the case, what do you expect them to do? Like Bass John said, once the government engages in legalized plunder, the plundered classes will attempt to engage in the making of the law. So I would expect that. I said, tell me how much they give to the presidential candidates. Because I have to know that under federal law, states regulate insurance. The, the federal government doesn't regulate insurance. He says, well, gee, I don't know. I said, yeah, well, guess what? I'm going to bet they don't give hardly anything to congressional candidates. But they give a ton to the state candidates. Why? Because it's a regulated industry. It's not the fault of the insurance companies being too big or trying to run things, right? If you have a regulated industry, you set up the incentives to make that happen. So, in the end, how, how, how do you solve this problem, right? The way you solve this problem in the end is to win the battle of ideas. Why is that? Because uh, Bastard also says, you know what, if you try and short circuit this uh, by trying to fix this problem of legalized plunder, if you just try to elect people, guess what? Once they're there, if the government can still engage in legalized plunder, they're going to end up doing it. And as Bob knows, there's this old joke that says, you know, people go to Congress thinking it's a cesspool, and after a couple years, they realize it's a hot tub. So, so putting the right people in, it would help if they can help explain why they're doing what they're doing. But the real way to do it is to make it so their constituency believes in it. If there's constituency believes in a limited government, then that's what they're going to end up espousing. You know, I was an Smith chief of Congress, Nick Smith chief of staff, right? And, um, you know, you can imagine uh, what our political philosophy was. Um, and so when the lobbyists would come in, um, you know, we could say, look, our constituency isn't going to go with this, right? You want to, you want to regulate, you don't want to increase government regulation, you know, love to help you, but my constituency just isn't going to go with that. And you know what? They don't get mad. They're going to come to, they're going to come to you when they need something that requires less government regulation. It gets the government out of their hair. Then they'll come to you. So they don't get mad. So all, your congressmen, your state representatives, your state senators, what are they going to do? They're going to respond to what you, the constituency, wants. And it can't just be you. You have to go out and you have to tell somebody else, right? And the way you do it is by getting their attention to start with, right? You, you, you spring that little observation on them. And once they observe, then you can start explaining the whole thing. But if you don't try, if you don't go out and try to win the battle of ideas, then we're just going to keep heading down the road to surf them. And what's going on in this building, and what's going on, you know, in the Vanguard School, and what's going on in all sorts of charter schools in the state of Colorado? You guys are doing the right thing, right? Why? Because it's competitive. It's a competitive market once you start putting charter schools in, right? If, if, if he does a lousy job teaching, teaching people, they go away, right? They go somewhere else. In fact, um, let me just think about this. I'll just close with this. Um, see this thing, right? I could take a video of you and I could email it to someone in London. 
And now you're going to tell me that we don't know how to teach a fourth grader to read in the city of Detroit. We can't teach, we don't teach fourth graders to read in the city of Detroit. When was the last time you heard anybody say, gee, I want to move to Detroit to send my kids to Detroit public schools? But you just say the same about Chicago public schools, or Baltimore public schools, or Atlanta public schools, or Los Angeles public schools, or Cleveland public schools, or Newark public schools, or Trenton public schools, Philadelphia public schools, right? What does that tell you? It's not a Detroit problem, it's a system problem. It's a systematic problem. So what, what do you need to do to, to solve that problem? You need to change the system. You need to move education more towards what, how we make these things, more towards like a market system is, which is what charter schools are doing. They're starting to move kids. I mean, people talk about this school. Um, why do they talk about this school? Because it does such a great job. And so what happens? People want to start sending their kids to this school. And that's going to continue, and that's going to happen in other charter schools throughout the state of Colorado. It's happened in Michigan. There's huge lines to try to get into charter schools in the state of Michigan, and it's true in Arizona. And, and that didn't have, used to happen. In 1993, there weren't any charter schools until they started in Wisconsin, 1993. So we are making a lot of progress. Um, you, you have way more ways to, to get your word out than you did in 1970, right? You can get on Twitter, by the way. I forgot. How many of you are on Twitter? You've got to get on Twitter. Okay, and you got to follow me on Twitter. Um, and one of the reasons you got to follow me on Twitter is um, John Miller, who runs the journalism department at Hillsdale. Um, he and I have a Twitter contest to see who has the most followers. Um, we've been doing it for like two years, and we both started out at about 300, we got a ton apart. And I just looked today, after I've been talked down there, um, I have 1907, or 1907, and he has uh, 1,894. Okay? So we're always within 10, 15 apart. I'm usually ahead of them, so I have bragging rights every time we meet, but I can't break out. So if you can get on there and follow me and get your friends to follow me, they'll be so bummed that next time I see him, we'll have 40 more followers than he did. Um, but anyway, you got a lot of ways to reach out right? that you didn't have in 1970. You got Fox News, you got the blogs, you got you know, all sorts of social media. You can organize things, uh, you can form liberty groups on, on Facebook, you can do all sorts of stuff to get the word out. So with that, I think we have, we go till 8, right? Correct. So we got like about 20 minutes for questions. And if you don't ask one, I'll just pick on you. And I did it twice today already. So somebody needs to have a question, yes. Yeah, that's, that's the question. Um, a lot of people ask that. How do I get from a uh, PhD at Berkeley to Hillsdale College? And uh, like, the grateful stead, like the Grateful Dead said, what a long, strange trip it's been. <laughs> yes, in the back. At the beginning, you said that economics ought to precede political science. But I noticed that you didn't say that philosophy, or particularly ethics, ought to precede economics. So I'm going to ask you an economics ethics question. In something like this. The tenets of Christianity are they more compatible with socialism or communism or uh, capitalism? Well, the, the, yeah, the, the, first of all, um, at the original economists, before they called them economists, were, were called um, what they were, they were called political philosophy. Um, Adam Smith, uh, his first book for which he was more famous was The Theory of Moral Sentiments which was a discussion of ethics and the like. And the question was, what's more consistent with Christianity, uh, socialism or central planning or market capitalism? And the answer is market capitalism. Why is that? Because what if, if, if you can't be philanthropic, for example, if what happens is the government takes your stuff and gives it to somebody else. You're not being philanthropic, they're not being philanthropic. If there's somebody that is homeless, and, you know, you see somebody on the street in Colorado Springs or Port Collins or Denver or someplace, and they're homeless, if you say, oh my gosh, the government should be taking care of this guy, you're not being philanthropic. If what you do is you say, hey, do you want to have lunch? Can I, can I find out what your problem is? Is there some place that, you know, will our church group take you? Um, that's what philanthropy is about. 
And so market capitalism, what's going to happen? There's going to be poor people in market capitalism, right? If you can't make very much stuff that other people want, you're going to be living in a van down by the river, okay? So what do we do about those people? What we do about those people is we have to take care of them. We have to take care of them ourselves. We have to be philanthropic. We have to set up, you know, uh, you know, Doctors Without Borders and, you know, Catholic Relief Services and all sorts of other stuff that is there to what? To take care of the poor. If you, I, if you Google um, Gary Wolf from Scrooge, actually, um, what will come up is a paper that I wrote a number of years ago uh, around Christmas. And what happens in, in um, A Christmas Carol is that the, uh, at the beginning, these folks come in and they ask Scrooge whether they will give, whether he'll give them some money, right, for their, you know, to help the poor out. And what does he say? He says, are there no poor houses? Which is what the government welfare program was in those days. He says, are there no poor houses? And then there's a whole two paragraphs where he goes on and says, hey, the government's taken all my stuff and it's supposed to be helping out the poor. Don't come to me. So what did we find? We find that it's the, the, the least charitable place in the world is Russia. Okay, why is that? Because they were brought up under a system that was socialist and the government was supposed to take care of the poor. So the, the, what does is, what is, what is market capitalism say? You've got to think about other people, right? And, and you can't violate their property rights. You can't uh, commit fraud, those sorts of things. And so it, the, 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 actually, if you're really interested, there's a thing called the Acton Institute, um, which is out of Grand Rapids. Uh, and they, that, that, it's a think tank that looks into the ethics of, of Christianity um, and market capitalism. Um, they have a, a journal called the uh, Journal of Markets and Morality that has a lot of good stuff on that. But uh, good question. Yes? I don't think